What are some of the biggest challenges you think in trying to keep people ahead so they can not only be on a decent diet themselves, but have their children on it? decent plan themselves. The education piece, but things at home that the kids can make themselves. What happens when your kids discover donuts? Do they like those things? Oh, Do they yeah. handle it differently? Their church, every Sunday they go to church and it's soda pop and donuts and chips. Mm -hmm. And I just, I cringe, but I live in the real world. What I try and do is help educate them as to the dose makes the poison. I don't want to create eating disorders. What's your take on zero sugar? Yeah, sodas? they're fine. At the end of the day, there's only three ways to lose weight. You have to be in a calorie deficit and you can either calorie restrict, you can time restrict, eat in whatever window. And the, the other one is restricting some sort of macro or uh, food item. Only one of those three ways. Every diet can fall into one of those three categories. Stan, what is new with you, buddy? What's going on? Oh, man. I, I, I moved into a new house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I had to buy a lawnmower. So you, uh, your wife kicked you out? It's an acre. Yeah. <laughs> it's an acre and a half. I haven't, uh, haven't done landscaping in over 20 years. And now wow. here I am with my arm halfway in the ground, uh, fixing irrigation, mowing grass. Mm. And You're like a real dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chopping Kids down. are watching you like in the yard. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't even help. They don't even bother to help. Mm. Yeah. But that's, uh, <sighs> are you out there getting frustrated? Like that's like a real dad. Like you're out there saying, God damn mm -hmm. this, God damn. <laughs> you know, it's funny is I did maintenance. Uh, I ran uh, multifamily properties for many years and I owned multifamily properties for many years. And I was a maintenance guy right out of college. And so I, I'm like the jack of all trades, master of none, right? The amount of mistakes that I made over the years trying to do, uh, y y you know, <laughs> plumbing and electrical on yeah. these apartments was laughable. Oh, don't leave it up to me, that's for sure. It, yeah. So I, I got this idea in mind that I can, I can do anything. And then you go out there and you got to mess it up pretty bad before you call a pro in. And mm -hmm. <laughs> you realize you probably spent more time and money messing it up than it would cost just to call the pro to begin with. So, Do you uh, YouTube it sometimes? I do. I often do. I had some uh, moles in the yard and I YouTube some little traps and I've been, I've been out there, uh, what's that, Caddyshack with Bill oh, Murray? Yeah. That's been me. Mm -hmm. I've been winning that battle. Are they lean enough for you to eat or no? No. Oh, man. <laughs> But too I, fatty of I, me. I looked at all kinds of options, pumping gas into the, into, <laughs> and lighting it. They had some people doing that. Yes. Ground <laughs> exploding. You know? It was actually, I went to take these. Sandy yards on fire. <laughs> oh. I had a whole bunch of these ugly shrubs and I was out there snipping them. I'm like, this is going to take forever because it's a huge property. Lots and lots of, I've got. That's probably good for the pecs, right? The clippers. Yeah, try and turn it into a workout. But, uh, <laughs> so then I pull up this YouTube short and there's this guy on there, big chaw to backy and the uh, pickup truck. And he's like, here's how you take that bush out and you wrap a chain around it and hooks it to the bumper and, broom, and takes out. So I go rent a U-Haul <laughs> yeah. and get a chain and I wrap it around those things and, broom, and those big bushes just broom, pop out of the ground. Sometimes they come out so fast they hit the back of the U-Haul, you know. Oh, wow. Uh, that must have been kind of yeah, fun. We made, it was kind of fun. We made short work of that. There's uh, nothing like heavy equipment to get the job done. Beats a shovel every day. Anything new with uh, vertical diet? You were mentioning like uh, some stuff with uh, kids that you're doing now. Yeah. You know, uh, vertical diet 4.0 is supposed to be out any day now. I've been saying that for a year. Uh, but we just keep adding and adding and adding things to it. Uh, but vertical kids is uh, something I've been working on for quite a while. Obviously, I, my kids are 9 and 11 now, and a mm -hmm. lot of parents uh, ask me about what uh, their children should be doing. And I uh, am hosting a Vertical Kids Power Hour every Sunday mm. at uh, Sin City Iron, the gym I own in Las Vegas now. And, uh, just little kids, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, uh, teaching them how to squat, bench, and deadlift, and oh, making it fun awesome. for them. And their parents come in. And, um, I like to put loads on them, and so we, you know, we give them a little bit of instruction, but mostly it's participation. And, um, the social media interweb uh, experts, of course, are like, oh, all those kids are going to get hurt. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, you just go take your kid to the jungle gym, okay? We talk about the injury rates compared between jungle gym usage and, <laughs> and squatting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, it's been fun. The kids, uh, the kids love it. It, it. it exploded. We got on the local news there. The Fox News affiliate came in and videotaped cool. all the kids. And so... Uh, the thing exploded. I got a couple helpers now. And Are they like dragon sleds and farmers carries? I do all of it. I start them with, you know, I do three rounds of, of uh, squat, bench, and deadlift, you know, just teaching the basics. And then we would we'll do a whole bunch of stuff. We'll do mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. med ball throws, we'll do some box jumps, we'll do some sled drags, uh, some chin ups, and things like that. And just keep them, just have them work hard for an hour. The parents just want to see them get tired, to be honest with you. And I really want to see them str uh, strain. I want to see them do something. 
sometimes something like a squat, uh, you know, there's a, a skill component to it and a balance and all that. So you're not really able to see what the, uh, get the kid to, to really strain. But with a sled, pushing a sled, yeah. you get maximum output from them, you know, yeah. especially if they're competing with each other. And that's, uh, they're always competing with each other who can push. Uh, I've got some little seven-year-old girl in there who, who out, who will push more on the sled than any of the guys. And they, they kind of crushes feel bad everybody. about them. Yeah, it crushes everybody. It's, uh, it's awesome. We have this, uh, uh, this one gymnast, this young gymnast who comes in, uh, was by far the strongest of the group and had mm. never lifted before. Uh, it does seem to matter what kind of sport you're exposed to. Uh, you know, gymnastics being the one that uh, uh, you have a, a lot of, you do a lot of uh, uh, body weight exercise and uh, that transferred over very well for, for her. But the only one thing that uh, I encourage the parents to do outside of the gym, um, other than, you know, just doing some push-ups and chin-ups at home, is sprinting. I'm a huge fan of sprinting for uh, the nervous system, for even for load. I mean, you, if you think about the pounds per square inch uh, yeah. uh, when sprinting under the foot, people are like, oh, squats, you know, you're going to get injured. It's, like, it, it, it's pales in comparison to the amount of load that you're going to put from sprinting. But it, it really helps with coordination and balance and uh, nervous system. You know, speed is obviously a, a key component to mm -hmm. uh, power being, you know, strength divided by time. Uh, and so, you know, it's just how, how much force you can produce as fast as you can produce it. And, and over speed running, you know, I have that over speed treadmill that we used with John Jones. And uh, we'll put kids on that and just get them to sprint. Uh, that's probably one of the biggest things. You ever it's, seen the Kipchoge treadmill? Uh -uh. They have uh, uh, this uh, treadmill that's set to like 13 miles an hour. Yeah. That's how fast uh, Ilya Kipchoge runs when he does a marathon. Oh, he can incredible. run for 13 miles an hour the entire time. So they have these giant treadmills at these uh, conventions, and people try to get on there and, and try to mimic or run whatever. <laughs> 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 and people just get toasted by it. But, yeah, he runs that way for two hours straight. That's incredible. So that was pretty close to your time, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. my my time was actually uh, about a half an hour faster than his. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it was that's incredible. I just rode a motorcycle the whole time. <laughs> I I did take the liberty, not that I I like to, you know, do anything that, that would insult you, but I did take the liberty of looking up. Uh, it's his favorite thing is to make fun of me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I looked up Oprah's time. And, and what did she uh, do? <laughs> she ran the faster than you, the Boston yeah. Marathon, I must say. And I think that, that one uh, post I made on Instagram, I'll catch up with her, she, her, her arms are also bigger than yours. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're winning in that, though. Nothing. <laughs> I'm not winning anything. I'm, I'm, fall, I'm falling behind. <laughs> but I don't mind it. Hey, it's a starting point. Yeah, good, good you know? for you. Gotta no, start we somewhere. don't want to talk about my running. You do. Uh, you don't do anything uh, conventionally. So, like, uh, I'm imagining you put, must have a plan for this vertical kid stuff. And I'm imagining that you're you're probably getting like some sort of high level coach in there or something like that, other than just your own self, who's already high level coach. Yeah, I mean, I partner with Damon McCune, Doctor Damon McCune, who's a PhD, RDN, was director of dietetics for UNLV, and, and taught in the exercise phys uh, uh, department there. So. Uh, he'll be my, my co-author again on this, uh, so it's very solidly science-based, but I'm kind of writing it for a five-year-old. It's more of an infographic sort of uh, book layout uh, uh, so that, uh, and to be honest with you, in today's time, that's kind of the way adults uh, expose yeah. themselves to information. Anyhow, just short uh, infographics, just something that's easy to understand if it's made for a fifth grader. Uh, but it's supposed to be for, uh, you know, conception to college, I say. Uh, for all ages, I'll, mm. I'll try and um, uh, give parents uh, some solid information on, on what uh, they can do for their child's uh, uh, health in terms of nutrition and performance, obviously. Uh, the big thing for me, I think, is uh, the next uh, evolution in terms of promoting the vertical kids is, uh, is to go to high schools and do presentations. And a lot of those are going to be highly motiv motivational. Kids need to be inspired. Mm. I find that when I've done colleges over the years and high schools over the years is they just they, they kind of need to... Um, be inspired, and then they need a uh, some very practical. Um, uh, I say it's one percent inspiration and ninety nine percent execution. I know you hear perspiration, mm -hmm. uh, and hard work is certainly important, but it's it's execution. Is that they just don't know what to do, or uh, parents don't know how to create um, uh, a sustainable uh, a program they can adhere to. Uh, it just seems. Like it's, uh, it's difficult f to, to navigate um, in terms of compliance, uh, time management, those kinds of things. So I, I try and 
create ways that make it easy on them to help their kids eat a better diet, uh, to get on a regular training program, and then talk about what, what are the most effective things they can do for their kids to prepare them for whatever. Uh, the, the sports-specific stuff is really a matter of the kid's personal preference. Hopefully there's some uh, uh, genetic uh, <laughs> predisposition for their sport so they can be good at it. As you know, you're not going to be a center for the <laughs> L.A. Lakers if you're five foot seven. Um, or probably not going to be a, a great uh, marathoner if you're Samoan and you know, you're 300 pounds. <laughs> uh, but understanding what a, a kid's, you know, uh, I think genetic predisposition is and putting them into positions where they can be successful uh, is helpful. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I try and build a foundation for them. I kind of put it into a, uh, a pyramid of sorts. And things like strength and speed uh, will benefit all sports. Um, I don't even call that general physical preparedness. That's, you know, that would be mostly cardio, et cetera. Like fundamental. Uh, but yeah, just, and it's the basis of all sports, no matter what sports you're playing. And, and now as early as junior high school, and certainly we see in high school and in college, uh, the kids are doing some sort of strength training. And it, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, uses the word essential for adolescents to participate in some sort of resistance training. And that uh, uh, not only helps them with their development, um, but it helps prevent injury, which is really important for a lot of these kids as they participate in mm -hmm. sports. And uh, they see that as being a, a huge component. So I try and set them up with programs that are easy to comply with that, that, that uh, um, allow them to have the foundation needed to perform well at any sport because uh, the skill component can be learned much faster. Uh, and then somebody who's significantly under muscled or under, you know, it's not strong enough, even with a higher level of skill will be outperformed by people who are just more athletic, faster, stronger, uh, to a point. And so I, I try and build that foundation for them. And that's what we're doing, uh, with our kids now. And what I'll promote a lot with the vertical kids as I, as I go around to high schools and, and make the presentations. I think something that's detrimental to our kids that do want an opportunity to play a sport is just them getting too heavy at too young of an age because then their strength to weight ratio is thrown way off. And, you know, it's, t you know, the kid that can't do the pull-ups and the kid that's a little heavier, it's just going to be harder, you know, and, and maybe that kid could be a lineman and maybe he can or excel. Or a power lifter. There's yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe he can excel somewhere yeah. else, but um, it's really tough. It's really challenging. Um, what are some of the things you're seeing as a parent now and now in working with these kids? Like, what are some of the biggest challenges you think in trying to keep people ahead so they can not only be on a decent diet themselves, but have their children on a decent plan themselves? Yeah. Well, a lot of it's just, just having things that are convenient, uh, the education piece, but things at home that the kids can make themselves. Mm. Uh, you just, you got to get the junk food out. I, mean, I don't care how many times you tell a kid, you know, if you've got that stuff right there in hand, they're going to, they're going to be eating it. Uh, so we, you know, we focus on obviously lean protein sources and fruits and vegetables and, and that kind of thing is the, as the foundation. What's in your house? Cause I've been to your house before. Why don't you walk people through a little bit? Like there's a lot yeah. of convenient, delicious food. Yeah. I, st uh, it's what's not in there mostly because I'm not too terribly picky as long as they, I, I tell you know, kids just protein first. I want them to get uh, as much. Interestingly enough, kids don't seem to need as much protein per meal to trigger muscle protein synthesis. It seems to just happen even at like 10 grams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, but you want to get enough protein throughout the day. And I, I, I kind of shoot for a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Uh, uh, Dr. Jose Antonio from the International Society of Sports Nutrition has two college age uh, uh, daughters, I believe, that compete in sports. And um, that was kind of his recommendation. It's a nice foundation. And the foods associated with that protein, a uh, variety of, of foods such as dairy, yogurt, preferably, and uh, eggs and uh, lean meats it's, and, uh, and fish, those kinds of foods are, you know, are very diverse in, in micronutrient quality and quantity. And so uh, add in some fruits and vegetables to that. Uh, oftentimes with kids, you've got a, um, a couple tricks we'll use is maybe smoothies, uh, juice smoothies to get the fruits and vegetables in. Mm -hmm. It's got to taste good. They're pretty picky about that kind of thing. Uh, you know, I, I like the monster mash because the kids will pick through and they'll eat the carbs and not the protein. So if I mix it together, whether it's scrambled eggs with rice or a carb or whether it's, uh, 
you know, your lean ground beef with rice or something so they can, it has a consistency and a taste that they value the bone Stan broth. made me this like giant bowl of monster mash when I went over his house. It was like the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah. He's like, here, take it. And it was just like this, I, just this giant, I don't know, like probably two pounds of meat in there or something yeah. like that. Yeah. The kids it love so it. Good. The kids love it. So uh, you got to find things that they'll, and then uh, again, you got to, you really got to, Take the ultra-processed uh, snack foods and candies. I don't have any soda pop in the house. So, uh, that kind of thing. What about alternatives to those things? Have you found Bingo. decent alternatives? Because I, I have like yeah. Quest bars and legendary Pop-Tarts and tasty pastries and stuff. I got uh, yep. all that shit in my house. Yep, there are definitely some alternatives that are higher in protein, lower in sugar um, that, that you can put in there. And that's an important point is that even with dieters, when I tell them to take the crap out of the house, you have to have all, you have to have substitutions. Mm -hmm. So when they get hungry, they'll eat. I like uh, yogurt and berries. The kids um, will put uh, uh, one of those uh, calorie-free mm. flavor packets. That's what uh, about. Yeah. yeah. Like the Crystal Light thing? Crystal Light, yeah. Because then there's a whole ton of different flavors. They find mm -hmm. their favorite flavor. Yeah. You can't put those too much of that stuff in there. It, it, it's too Super strong. strong yeah. But just a little bit. That's how I get them to eat yogurt. I'm a big fan of of, uh, of Greek yogurt for the kids. I think it just has so many benefits. Throw some protein health. powder in there too. It's delicious sometimes. Yep, yeah. uh, uh, protein powder. I won't even let them eat. Like if if they want ice cream, uh, I'll tell them they got to eat their protein first. Or does he know? You, you got. Oh yeah, the ninja. Yeah, there's a something called a ninja creamy. Yeah, and it will turn even like your your regular protein shakes into like an ice cream. That's, That's what we need. Have you discovered it? You, you I haven't. haven't. I have the kids do scoops of protein in the ice cream. I won't let them eat ice cream straight. They got to add protein to it. Stan, oh, you, you can li literally make a pro like it's it, you can be a consistency of a protein shake. But when you do the thing, it has when you make it into an ice cream, it has the consistency of ice cream. It could be like eighty or ninety percent protein. Yo. It, it doesn't, doesn't really need a lot of carbs. It doesn't need a lot of fat. I love this this passion. It's the it's way so I talk good. about the monster. Bed. The Ninja Grill, where I cook like salmon or stuff in. I just did a video on that recently. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable! It it's life changing. When I get a client that calls me and does like a phone consult or or, or hits me up for some uh, coaching, some of the biggest changes, some of the most, um, I, I think, uh, the information that they appreciate the most is when I tell them how to prepare the food so that they're good. Because then it becomes, again, you know, part of a, a lifestyle that yeah. they can sustain. And they get a diet. They're like, oh, my God, this is good. I don't even feel like I'm dieting. <laughs> and you still uh, have things like what you just mentioned. You still have your monster mash that people can order, right? Yeah, yeah, meal prep company. So they can they can dig in there. And, and I, I, I even eat my own meal prep. And I pay for it. I don't, I don't get free food. Um, uh, obviously, food is uh, somebody has to buy it and make it. Um, but it, it's better than what I can make myself, mm. which is why I, you know, I buy it and it's convenient is the big thing. You know, I packed a bunch up and brought it up here with me when I uh, left uh, Vegas to fly up here to Sacramento. And it's you got just, every power lifter like on that, like everyone's hooked on it. Yeah. Surprised no one uh, tried to raid your bag today. It's convenient. <laughs> it really is. What, what happens when your kids, you know, they, they go and they discover donuts or ice cream or these other things in other places. You know, I think Andrew has a few stories of that, but like, how do they, like, do they like those things? Oh, do they yeah. handle it differently? Their church, every Sunday they go to church and it's soda pop and donuts and chips. Mm -hmm. And I just, I cringe, but, uh, you know, I live in the real world. Uh, what I try and do is, is, uh, help educate them as to, as to, uh, the dose makes the poison. Yeah. And I, I don't want to create eating disorders and, and you know, body dysmorphia. I've got to be cautious to make sure that I, I give them the education. That's part of what uh, will be in the Vertical Diet uh, or the Vertical Kids book mm -hmm. uh, is that there's ways to handle those situations such that they can, as best they can when the opportunity presents itself, is make those decisions. The challenge is, is uh, I can't remember who one time had told me that when you look at the opportunities to eat, uh, you know, off schedule, uh, whether it's uh, uh, a holiday, a birthday, Fourth uh, of July, yeah, a celebration of sort of what for whatever, uh, you know, and then how many kids are in your class at school, and how many birthdays do they have? And I mean, there aren't too many days that you can't find a special occasion at which you have to have some sort of junk food. Today involved. was stressful. Yes, that <laughs> today was really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Today was horrible. <laughs> right? Exactly. Today was meh. <laughs> it always it seems matter. to be a good reason. You <laughs> yeah. know? And then it's the reward component. You know, Dad, I did this. Can I have that? Mm. You know, can I have ice cream? We did really good today. Did all our chores. And mm. you certainly don't want to interfere with, <laughs> you know, the ongoing chore uh, yeah. 
project, but uh, at the same time, you know, what rewards are you going to give them and what's the... I, I'll be honest with you, though, I find ice cream to be the least offensive of, of the options uh, because it is dairy, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and it was interesting. I think Lane Norton just did a, a video recently. He posted and said ice cream was uh, cardioprotective. He said it was actually <laughs> the healthiest of desserts. And yes. He was huh. being somewhat facetious, but there is some research to suggest that it's probably the least... Uh, least worst option out yeah. there, and, and there's probably ways, like you mentioned, with the uh, that ninja, ninja creamy, ninja mm -hmm. creamy, that you can choose the ingredients such that it's not as high in sugar. Uh, you know, it's interesting. My pops is 92 years old. He lives with me, has for a number of years now. Mm. He's got macular degeneration, and he's uh, uh, had two hip replacements, mm. and he's practically deaf. And so it's pretty interesting. He turns his TV way up and <laughs> watches his MSNBC, and I have to listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> at uh, total volume in the next room. Um, he uh, he started drinking. He asked me for some V8. And I, I thought I was sharper than this, but I went to Costco and I threw V8 in the, in the uh, cart and I brought it home and I gave it to him. And I used to drink V8 when I was a kid. He used to, to feed it to us. And then uh, like three days later, his, his ankles started to swell. <laughs> and I keep a real close eye on that with him, you know. And my pops, your ankles are swelling. Uh, and so I started looking through all of his diet and V8 has like 900 mm -hmm. milligrams of sodium mm -hmm. for a little six ounce can. He was drinking four a day. <laughs> yeah. He was getting wow. four grams of sodium Like a, a little can of soup, yeah. yeah. And he uh -huh. eats sauerkraut and pickles and, and, you know, we have some frozen food meals for him, stuff yeah. from Costco for, for quick, easy microwave stuff. He was probably getting in eight grams of sodium a day. He sits in his chair all day, you know, and his, uh, so I, you know, I had to pull that right out. But the point of the story is, is so I was looking for some replacements for him and I ended up ice cream. Well, it's 25 milligrams of sodium and he loves ice cream and he'll eat it with fruit. <laughs> and so I'm like, hey, that's yeah. a health food. Fruit's a health food. And so, and uh, he loves these, uh, uh, what are they? And they're, sure. It, it, they're the chocolate. Oh, fair life. Fair life oh, yeah. protein drinks. Ah, Thirty grams of protein, mm -hmm. like two grams of sugar and, yeah. and one gram of mm -hmm. fat. Uh, and so he he'll down those every it's day. It's important so. to point out your dad's not heavy, right? Uh, he's he's yeah he's a little overweight oh, he from what he should now. be at, at ninety two. He's carrying a little bit of a belly, mm. but. Uh, he's, he's, he's been relatively thin most of his life, right? Wasn't he? Yeah, he was recently. He was a runner. Yeah, yeah. he ran the Boston Marathon. And, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, he was a runner. We used to do used to do jogs in the morning. It's, he'd be one of those runners that every step was a fart. Bink, bink, bink. You got to get them out, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm jogging. My like, Jesus Christ! <laughs> you know, behind yeah. him. He'd get up at six o'clock in the morning and go. I actually went jogging uh, with him for quite many years there when I was a kid. Wow. Yeah. Was that good soccer prep, uh, running with him when you were young? Yeah, you know, I got to be honest with you, I was never good at the endurance stuff, ah. the, the running. I was always explosive. I could I could sprint, but I didn't have the the endurance, and I'm still that way with training now. I really like the, like a guy like Eric Spoto, he's got a huge single, but he's also, he can bench 315 for 45 reps. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, the muscular endurance is incredible. <laughs> um, same with like a guy like John Jones, he's both strong and has incredible muscular endurance. I, I don't have the, the, any of the endurance at all. I, I just, remember asking Eric, I was like, how many times can you bench 225? He's like, that's oh, too light. I never tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. He just wouldn't stop. <laughs> he was coming in every Monday night and breaking the, uh, the world record. Uh, I think it was the Guinness Book of World Records for the most pounds bench pressed in, I don't know what it was, 90 like seconds or oh. two minutes. Yeah, just as many pounds as you... Every Monday night he was breaking the record, and you know the story about how he never competed in an actual bench press competition until he benched 700 in the gym. Wow. And he wouldn't have benched 700 in the gym except for uh, we had put... All forced him. We, yeah. we put five pounds on each side of a, of a 695 lift oh, that he was about to do and made it 705. There's a video on YouTube of this. And when he benched it and he gets up and we were like, you know how much that was? He's like, 695. Like, nope. And he looked, he's like... And he did 705, and that's when he decided he was going to come down and, and do your meet. It was not until he did 705. TRT, it's a popular topic. A lot of guys are hopping on it. It's something that we've talked about a lot. And you might think you're a candidate, but how would you know if you haven't got your blood work done and you don't know where your markers are? That's why we've partnered with Merrick Health, owned by Derek for more plates, more dates. And the cool thing about Merrick is you'll get your blood work done, and you'll also have a patient care coordinator that can help you analyze your blood work, analyze your testosterone, and all these other markers to help you actually figure out if you're someone who needs TRT, because there could be things that you could be doing nutritionally with supplements or even with your lifestyle that can boost your testosterone to the levels that they should actually be at. Andrew, how can they get their hands on it? 
Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. And at checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off the Power Project panel, the checkup panel, or any individual lab that you select. Again, that's at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. Promo code Power Project at checkout. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. What you got over there, Andrew? Yeah, you mentioned uh, not having soda in the house. Uh, what's your take on diet soda or like the uh, zero sugar? Yeah, sodas? they're fine. Well, there's a big uh, dust up now on Instagram because the IARC committee and mm -hmm. uh, uh, said that aspartame was uh, a possible carcinogen. Everything the IARC committee has ever touched, probably over a thousand different things, they put in there as a possible carcinogen. So it's not mm -hmm. a. Uh, but the the problem is is that that uh, their definition uh, doesn't account for dose. And, um, you know, you'd have to eat drink 800 bottles of Coke a day, mm. of Diet Coke a day to have any kind of adverse effect. But um, anyhow, the, probably people seeing that information would wonder if it was unhealthy. It's not. Uh, we do see that replacing um, sugar-laden drinks with diet sodas does uh, facilitate weight loss uh, for for people who are trying to do so. So that's a, a good recommendation. I have any problem with diet soda, and I'll let the kids uh, have a diet soda here and there. Um, uh, it's just, you know, as a treat or whatever. It's the, the least worst option. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of something called Olipop? No, I haven't heard of that either. Yeah, it has I prebiotic so. fibers in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it ends up being like three or four grams of sugar. It has prebiotic fiber and something else. It's uh, And it... Tastes pretty. Tastes really oh, they good. Taste actually, good. yeah. There's yeah. a bunch of versions of it too. Yeah, yeah. Do you get the kids menu when you go to the restaurant? Sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Every now and then, I'm just it like gets a grilled cheese. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it, <laughs> I saw that Sprouts one day. And I was like, hmm, that looks kind of good, and it is very good. Yeah. It's very low calorie, and it does. I don't think it has any artificial like sweeteners. Chicken tenders. No, I don't think so. If it's anybody funny. like really cares about that, yeah. so we. I think we had this conversation sometime, maybe a couple of years ago, where we were talking about how I, I don't really have cravings, you know, because I was ever since college i've always looked at uh, food as uh, can Fuel. Will that make me bigger yeah mm, you yeah. know and if i had any room in my stomach i was i was only going to put <laughs> something in there that would make me bigger and so that's kind of how i always looked at food i really don't have a a, a sweet tooth like that so yeah. that's awesome that's i remember good. yeah you said that uh when you would let loose you would have strawberries yeah <laughs> and, and yeah. i just remember i looked at you know looked into myself and be like you gotta get better dude there, <laughs> <laughs> like i gotta get better that is a huge <laughs> treat for me i recommend that to all my clients that <laughs> fat-free greek yogurt the kirkland brand from Costco. Costco tastes great. Mm, Most fat-free Greek yogurt, they, they taste like uh, chalk. Mm -hmm. You know, they're pretty terrible, but that one it has a really good consistency. And you mix that with some strawberries, that's a treat. That's a <laughs> dessert to me. And, you, you know, if blueberries is your favorite, raspberries, whatever it is. But that's the like, oh, my God, there's one now. Costco has them. They're these little grapefruit cr cups. Have you seen those little grapefruit no. cups? Uh, they, have the big, right they have the big grapefruit fruit, uh, uh, containers but it's, uh, it, it's peeled uh, mm. grapefruit, and so you can eat a ton of it really fast. But these mm -hmm. little cups at Costco, you just peel the top off. They're in a light uh, syrup, so I, I, I pour that out. But eating that with yogurt, oh, my God. Mm. I, I've, got a, I've got a $100 a month habit now. They're a buck a piece. I've been eating like three a day. Uh, I the same thing with Nun tablets at one time. I had a $100 a month <laughs> habit. I was drinking Nun tablets all day long every day, and after a while I realized, damn, things are expensive. Mm. <laughs> And uh, I had a hundred dollar a month habit just drinking. Every time I look at a particular food, I end up doing that. I end up calculating <laughs> what's the monthly cost of adding yeah. this to my diet program. I went in the other day and bought salmon and, and steak. They have those. Uh, Costco has those little thin sliced uh, steaks, super super thin mm -hmm. slices of steak. And I mm -hmm. throw them in the uh, the uh, Ninja Grill, and I, I kind of tend to overcook them a little bit. It's probably not great with those with the heterocyclic am amines or whatever. Mm -hmm. that, um, but they're almost like bacon mm -hmm. at that point because they're mm -hmm. crispy when they come out. But uh, those are like 50 bucks a pack for salmon and steak. I got to the front and I, I'd only bought a few things. There's like $372. Mm -hmm. and you, I'm like, 372 I look down and there's $100 worth of meat between wow. the salmon and the steak. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's unbelievably delicious in that. Uh, again, I did that video on my on my YouTube and my Instagram uh, of cooking the salmon in that uh, in that Ninja Grill, mm -hmm. outrageous. And I'm not a huge salmon guy, but it was 
incredibly delicious. My daughter loves it now. She'll eat salmon almost every night. Mm. Um, salmon to me is, I, I think, just a superfood. It's, it's, it's a fantastic one. I, I love it when the kids will eat those kinds of things, preferably over, say, a mac and cheese, obviously. Yeah. yeah. In your house, do you guys get an opportunity to eat together? And does everyone eat like a little similar? Or is it just like kind of mayhem? Yeah, we're kind of on our own schedule. We have, you know, we have a lot of family. My wife's Samoan. She has 12 brothers and sisters, and a number of which live in town and have kids themselves. And mm-hmm. that's kind of why we bought the big house was... Uh, with the big indoor pool, so we could have a, a place to host our family, and so oh, we'll have, indoor pool. We'll That's have, cool. Yeah, it's 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 awesome. It's That's salt water neat. too. It's, oh, uh, nice. Yeah, so the kids swim every day, and they don't have all the chlorine eyes and stuff. Wow. It's, it's, you can use a lot That's less be chlorine nice in, out in, uh, uh, in Vegas, in particular. Nevada. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty nice, but. The, the whole the whole place facilitates the the, the kids and the, all gathering and mm-hmm. um, they're they love to come over they sing uh, in the choir at church and stuff mm. and so cool uh, we get together but uh, sometimes they bring some pretty crappy food over mm-hmm. uh, Samoans are kind of known for having a high fat diet you know all the uh, the pig and the uh, there's just a lot of gooey stuff that <laughs> it's not a lot of meat in a lot of that food it's, it tends to be really really fatty. Uh, but uh, sounds delicious. But the kids Pork are always like, "Dad, I'm hungry. Dad, I'm hungry." I'm like, nice to meet you, hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid dad jokes, you know. <laughs> Poor kids. <laughs> Shit, I swore I'd never do. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so I'll cook for them, and and when that oppor- I like you know when that opportunity presents mm-hmm. itself because you know I'm I'm, a, I'm not just like, what do you want? I say we well, have these three options or these two options. I'll make mm-hmm. you this or that. You know, as opposed to what do you want? And if what do you want is always, um, uh, you know, something high in carb and low in protein, yeah. generally speaking. You've uh, turned a vertical diet into a great business for yourself. I don't, I don't think that that was the initial goal. I think you just were like, I think this could help some people and maybe I can make a little bit of money off of it. But, I mean, you've been at it for what, like almost 10 years now or eight years or... Yeah, I think damn near seven years. Um, obviously, the meal prep company is uh, was great. Uh, had a little hiccup there uh, last year. My business partner passed away, and uh, <clears throat> not a, appropriate to say anything bad. But I ended up finding out that there was half a million dollars in loans taken out against my company mm. uh, when that all transpired, and um, and so we ended up having to shut down for about six months while I went through all the legal hassle with that. Uh, but then reemerged, reopened, um, and are fully in service now. And uh, got about half my customers back, which is great, and they're happy. That, that I eat the food every day, and had had for years. Traveled with it. You guys, I brought it up here, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, delicious stuff. And, and so I was kind of like, you know, I, I feel for my customers because I'm I'm a client. You know, I'm a user, <laughs> and I'm pretty addicted to uh, having those convenient, good tasting foods and. Uh, so it's, that, that's been great. Uh, the vertical diet ebook was, was great. And being able to evolve that over the years from version 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0 and to add in some things and revise some things. And now we're very close to getting the 4.0 out. Um, that's been awesome. And I, I provide the updates for free to anybody who's bought a previous version. I just, I think it's important to stay current, uh, and to make the, you know, whatever changes. It's interesting that your brother, Chris, Chris Bell said to me earlier, he goes, uh, how has your diet evolved? What's changed? And the major stuff hasn't. And what's interesting about that is I remember years ago I was on a podcast and some guy commented on YouTube down below. He's like, Stan just keeps repeating himself every time. <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, because I talk about the shit that works, you uh-huh. know, and I don't make shit up and I don't take these plausible or possible mechanisms of action from rat studies and then take these giant logical leaps into 27% improvements in this, that, and the other. And when there's not a single human trial to suggest such. And yeah. uh, a lot of people exaggerate the meaningfulness of particular interventions. And I, your audience probably knows the name of who those folks are. They're quite popular because they, are, they, they traffic in uh, sexy, exciting things that, uh, generally speaking, uh, have very little meaningful difference in terms of outcome. And so the, the basics are the basics. And for me, I, I focus mostly on compliance. How can I get you to do these things that work mm-hmm. consistently over and over again? And the vertical diet includes a lot of food. Like there's a lot of different types of food on there. It's not, you know, sometimes with like a very particular bodybuilding diet or paleo style diet or something like that, it seems like you have to eliminate so much, but 
Um, it's funny that I got, I got tagged meat and fruit and vegetables. Right, and right. All as compared to the guru diet, it's funny that at, at, at one time I kind of got tagged as being restrictive because I had, had introduced FODMAPs to, to those people who were susceptible to IBS or to gas and bloating. And the FODMAPs is perceived to be a, uh, an elimination diet, a, a restriction diet. Uh, it's pretty generous. It's, there's over 100 items on that menu. And really, I only proposed it for those individuals who. Uh, we're susceptible to those things. It's individualistic, dose dependent, and um, uh, but in comparison to things like, um, you know, the typical guru diet where they exclude red meat and they exclude fruit and they exclude dairy and they take the egg yolk out and mm-hmm. you're pretty much eating egg whites, tilapia, uh, you know, broccoli and uh, a tablespoon of peanut butter. That's your pre-contest <laughs> diet. That was that was the go-to thing. Uh, so I was more inclusive. I thought that you know I was really uh, providing. Uh, a much more broad, you know, dietary choice. And so, uh, yeah, I've, I've tried to endeavor to find a, a program that people would consider to be something that they could adhere to long-term. It became part of a lifestyle instead of uh, something they did temporarily to achieve a particular goal. Exactly. Uh, I, I did pull back on, say, people who are trying to gain weight. I was cautious about things like, um, you know, pizza, pasta pancakes as being the driver of that because we saw a lot of metabolic syndrome from that, as you and I both recall from being over 300 pounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some things you can eat too much of and, and suffer the consequences in terms of fatty liver and insulin resistance and high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. and, and high cholesterol. Uh, so I, I tried to make some adjustments for that in the diet. But uh, at the end of the day, there's only three ways to lose weight. You have to be in a calorie deficit and you can either uh, calorie restrict in which case you just measure and weigh all your food and make sure that you eat less than what you burn in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can time restrict, you eat in whatever window, uh, and oftentimes that uh, helps people to eat less total calories in the day. Uh, if you can't do it with a 10-hour window, then maybe you got to go to eight, maybe you got to go to six in order for you not to overeat over the yeah. course of the day. Um, and the, the other one is, uh, is uh, restricting some sort of uh, macro or uh, food item. And that's more like your paleo or your keto or you eliminate carbs or you eliminate, you know, particular foods. Uh, fortunately, in the process of eliminating those foods, we tend to, they tend to get demonized. And that's not the goal, really. It's, it's just, hey, if you stick to this menu, you'll probably lose weight because you're taking out a whole bunch of calories from, a, you know, an entire macro group. And so there's only one of those three ways. And, mm-hmm. and every diet can fall into one of those three categories. Uh, and they all work for the same reason, the calorie deficit. Yeah. Uh, it's just that some people find it easier to adhere to different styles of restriction. And uh, whichever diet becomes the, feels the least restrictive, whatever one you can adhere to is probably the best diet for you. Mm-hmm. And that may be, that may change over time. That may be very effective initially. And then long term, you may decide, uh, hey, I want to add this back in or that back in. Uh, but meanwhile, there should be some process of education to understand uh, that different foods have different satiety benefits, uh, potentially different caloric density. Yeah. You know, when you start to add in a pat of butter here, a, a tablespoon of oil there, those calories can start to... You ever looked at... Uh, probably not, but <laughs> you ever looked at McDonald's, uh, those little dipping sauces? Mm, mm. Uh, when I was working with John, yeah. uh, I probably told this story before, but I was working with John Jones. Uh, John likes to eat fast food. John eats what he wants to eat when he wants to eat. Uh-huh. Right? It's whatever he's hungry for. And I was just like, just eat enough protein, John. Uh, or don't just eat one meal a day, because some days he would just eat one meal. Yeah. And so r- really it wasn't rocket science with him. I was just trying to get some level of... of and so uh, we would leave Jackson Wink and we'd be, Matt and I would be driving. And I'd look in the rearview mirror and John's car would be whoosh, in the McDonald's <laughs> drive through And I'm on the phone. I'm like, John. He goes, no, I'm, I'm getting gas. <laughs> You're getting gas. You're going to McDonald's drive through uh, So I looked up on the internet uh, the menus of the places that John likes to frequent and tried to at least give him choices. Yeah. Uh, I do this in the Vertical Kids as well because I think it's a, it's a, a great way that you can – have kids able to do what everyone else is doing, but make particular choices. Uh, and so I would try and find the higher protein, lower fat uh, food choices for them at, at those restaurants with the fast, whatever fast foods they were. So uh, 
Don't know where I was headed with that, but... Uh, You're mentioning but, the little dipping sauces. Yeah. Oh, when I was looking at those dipping sauces at McDonald's, some of those are like 300 calories. Oh. That little tiny cup. I'm like, how do you get 300 calories in that little tiny cup? That's delicious. <laughs> wow, that is a very small cup, too. Yeah. Holy and, shit. And some of them were very little calories. And so there's going to be a huge difference Whoa. of things. I think you go to a restaurant, and some guys are like, you know, they're on the vertical diet, and they're eating top sirloins and, um, you know, 96.4 beef at home. And they're like, hey, we're going to Ruth Chris. Can I just get a steak? I'm like, that's a ribeye with a cube of butter melted on it. Mm. So your steak at home is very different in terms of total calories. It's yeah. probably at home is probably a 350 calorie steak, and it, uh, mm. it's probably a 1700 at, uh, mm. at uh, Ruth Chris. So we have to. There's a lot of hidden calories, and whether even like a. Um, a pan-fried uh, steak, what would you call that if you cook that in a, uh, just cook a steak in a pan with oil? Yeah. Uh, a lot of times, it's a lot of oil. Mm -hmm. and you soak up into the steak, that ends up in your, you know, even just dressings on your salad. You know, that's 300 calories that you probably, you know, aren't really accounting for. So yeah. it's good to get educated about calories. It's not necessarily good to obsess about them for some people. They don't like the, the whole process of tracking every single thing and, um, but it, it, long term, you should have some a semblance of what foods keep you full and what foods are super calorie dense if you want to be able to maintain weight loss. On the steak side of things, I've never used the Ninja Grill, but like just air frying a steak. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, air frying, when I used to air fry a steak, uh -huh. it would just come out gray all the way through. It was terrible. The mm. outside, inside, it just looked terrible. Really? Okay. The Ninja Grill is different. I don't know how they do it. They're magical over there. There's mm -hmm. something going on. There's like little cooks inside or something. <laughs> you know, these, yeah. little, these little, little elves. Little elves inside. Oh, the, like the Ninja Foodie Grill. The Ninja Foodie Grill. That's what I use. Yeah. Two little drawers. Yeah, okay. The outside has that has that cooked, and the inside can still be pink. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, so that's, again, when I get a client and I tell them, you need to get this Ninja Grill. Yeah. And when they're on sale at Costco, sometimes they're like, uh, on Amazon, they're like $199 or uh -huh. something like that. Sometimes Costco has it for like $119. Mm -hmm. I'm putting out a blast. I'm like, Ninja Grills are on sale. <laughs> you got to get down and get the Ninja Grill. I've done that. <laughs> and, and they're, I mean, it's, I've had you know, guys who have signed up with me, their wives would be like, oh my God, this is so good. This yeah. is life changing. Mm -hmm. you know? And I don't say that about a lot of things. You know, I've been in this business a long time. Mm -hmm. But things like a CPAP, a 24-ounce thermos to have hot food when you travel, uh, and a Ninja Grill, those are pretty life-changing. There we go. Yeah. The Power Sandal version 2 is here. Last year, we partnered with Shama Sandals to make a sandal that all of you guys would like to wear out, but would also be functional for your feet because, well, flip-flops suck and they're bad for your feet. That's why we made these. But these are the version 2 has a tan Vibram sole, which will last you thousands of my miles. A German leather footbed, which will mold to your foot with every step you take. So the cool thing about these sandals is that the more you wear them, the more comfortable that they become. It has a heel strap so that it doesn't mess with the way you walk and you can have your natural gait, which is why in these power sandals, not only can you walk in them, which we're all walking, you can run in them, you can sprint in them, you can lift in them, and they're gonna be great for your feet. But now, rather than the all black version one we had, there's a little bit of color to the baby. So now you look a little bit better in these. If you want to get them, head to powerproject.live. We appreciate your support and we are so pumped to get these on your feet. A lot of things, a lot of things you're sharing may not have changed a whole lot, but um, some of the influence that we see uh, in the health space has changed a lot. And yeah. we've seen a lot of things just end up uh, falling right into our lap, right into our hands. I hear you. Where other people now are talking about the importance of strength. Yeah. People are talking about the importance of grip strength, the importance yeah. of leg strength. And I think uh, we've been kind of sitting back being like, yep, all right, here's our chance I'm, to give people a little I'm speech. I'm almost a little smug about it. I got to be honest with you. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm quiet. I've been in this business you know, a long time and I'm patient and I watch people go through these evolutions, these different dietary trends that have come and gone and come back and gone again. Um, and I saw, uh, you know, a lot of folks, it was the whole running phase, run, 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 running's fine. Uh, <laughs> but those people wouldn't lift at all, you know, mm -hmm. and they probably didn't prioritize protein. It was all carbs, carbs, carbs. I yeah. remember my pops used to just down spaghetti the night before a marathon and he would just feel terrible the next day. He didn't understand the whole process. The uh, runner's world was, was not very good with nutrition for many, many, many years. Uh, certainly back in the seventies. And, uh, you're right. All the longevity people in that space now, 
Uh, well, I'm gonna say all of them. Uh, Walter Longo is kind of a, a low protein, yeah. you know. God forbid him to. I think David Sinclair too. David Sinclair is the same way. You know, mouse studies and um, and that kind of thing. But them, notwithstanding, because they're both scrawny. Uh, <laughs> Everyone else <laughs> is lifting weights. Peter Tia, kind of probably the most popularized, uh, yeah. one of the most uh, popular uh, with his new book, Outlive. And um, I've been following him for years as well. And uh, at times, somewhat disappointingly, listening to him do the keto diet and all this other stuff and probably too much cardio. And he's even talked himself about the fact that uh, he didn't have the right balance. And when strength became important, things changed. Mm -hmm. He started incorporating, uh, you know, more carbohydrates in his diet, uh, particularly fruits. Uh, Paul Saladino, uh, when performance mm -hmm. became a priority and lifting weights and getting stronger, uh, he went from strictly uh, carnivore, keto, intermittent fast, how many other <laughs> things you could pile onto that list of fad diets. Uh, he uh, now eats fruits and, uh, and yogurt, you know. Uh, but it, Mike Mutzel, uh, who's a sharp guy, masters in, in uh, nutrition or biochemistry, one of the two, uh, I went on his podcast years ago, and he was he was uh, keto, intermittent fast. Now he eats carbs around the training window. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding how important performance is during that given time period where you're trying to provide a sufficient stimulus for progress. Uh, and the, the better you can perform, the more weight you can lift, um, you know, the higher intensity that you can invest into that bout, uh, the better results you're going to get from it. And so you're 100% right. We've seen, we've seen this evolution now where strength is becoming important. Yeah. We see it with women uh, who are focused on, you know, I think the CrossFitters and, and especially kind of led the way. We saw this in powerlifting, the kind of the transition from all men in the meet to half women in the meet, yeah. and most of those women were CrossFitters. Yeah. Because once, it's addicting, once you start touching a heavy weight like a deadlift, yeah. oh, I could do 10 more pounds, or I could do one more rep. And that's, it's the same thing I do with the kids. You mentioned that, you know, what's important for, for kids, uh, and that's the hook. If It should be fun. It should have some sort of competitive uh, fervor, if that's what attracts them to where they'll do more because mm -hmm. somebody else, did. they saw somebody else do more. And we see that with the women, and now we see that with uh, uh, with longevity people who who have bought in, uh, you know, uh, and the research as well supports, as you mentioned, uh, grip strength for increased uh, lifespan and health span, uh, which I should mention is a proxy for strength. It's not necessarily you have to go out and you got your grippers here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, any level of of strength from any exercise, any resistance exercise, especially women, bone mineral density, we see the decline. In, uh, an increase in osteoporosis as they age. Um, you can't fix that with protein and calcium. And sometimes the information, uh, the studies that they do is just because of convenience. So it might be convenient for them to test an elderly right. person. It's grip. a proxy. It's a convenient yeah. uh, and, and uh, repeatable test. Um, but you need resistance training. I mentioned protein and calcium doesn't solve that problem. The resistance training component has to be included with those substrates in order to improve bone mineral density, mm -hmm. uh, especially in postmenopausal women. We see now that, uh, that uh, because of the low estrogen, it um, becomes important that they seek um, uh, you know, endocrinologist input and uh, potentially uh, medication to increase their estrogen because that has a significant impact on bone mineral density and endothelial function. And so their cardiovascular disease risk increases after post postmenopausal because of that. So, um, you know, you're hundred percent right. It, and it's exciting. You know, the industry has exploded as a result. Of course, we've got bodybuilding, figure physique, bikini, wellness, you know, people competing, yeah. um, you know, and the CrossFit of mm -hmm. course is, is still huge, but now, uh, you know, just the gen pop, uh, the, uh, uh, dad bods and soccer moms are in the gym crushing weights. One thing that's real interesting about, again, Matt Whitmer out at Beat Training in Cincinnati, he's been doing this for over 20 years, uh, mm -hmm. training Gen Pop in his gyms over there, just runs just personal training centers. Um, and he'll bring in people that, that have never lifted in their life, and they're up in years, and they maybe even have some uh, injuries or recovering from whatever else. He puts their name on a board. He puts a, a bunch of different PRs. You know, mostly you go to a gym and there's a big whiteboard that just has like the, the, the biggest lift in the gym. Yeah, yeah. 
he has everybody's name. He's got like 50 clients listed and he's got like 15 lifts across the board. Mm -hmm. And now they start comparing themselves to other, and you put their age there. Yeah. So they compare themselves to other women in a similar age group and what they're lifting. And, and, and that starts to, you know, get people amped up about making progress, but he measures everything by strength. And it's not just a single rep. It could be a five rep this, and it's not just a squat bench and deadlift. He has a whole variation of different lifts. Yeah. And every day they come into the gym, the goal is to set a PR of something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, it doesn't have to be a straight squat. It could be a, a five rep box squat. You know, I'm gonna, let's set a PR today, pick yeah. one. And that's what they do. And that makes it fun. Cause it's like, you're going in and usually like most people, you can just do a workout, but if you have a goal for something, right? It's like you came out winning something out of your workout. 100%. How, how did you like change things? Cause I know you mentioned in terms of your nutrition, not much has changed. The concepts are pretty similar. Maybe it's a little few things adjusted here and there. But as far as exercise, you probably train a little bit differently than you did maybe a decade ago. Yeah. I mean, we've been doing the 10 minute walks forever. So I still have a, I'm still a big believer in having some GPP some general physical preparedness, obviously bodybuilding, uh, the way I used to do it in particular with the shorter rest periods and the higher volume contributed a lot to my, uh, cardiovascular fitness, of course. Um, uh, those things are still, you know, very important to me that I, I move around a lot. I, I, you know, I breathe a lot. What I do differently now and I do with my clients who experience kind of the same evolution that I did is I, I try not to hurt myself. Uh, I try not to do things that create an extraordinary amount of fatigue, even when strength is the goal. Uh, last fall, I was trying to get my deadlift up. And so over about a five month period, I was only deadlifting once every four or five weeks. And I went wow. from like a 635 to a 650 to a 675 to a 700 to a 725 over the course of five months. But I didn't, I deadlifted once a month or once every five weeks, right mm -hmm. in about that. In between those deadlift times, I would use lower fatigue movements to progress my strength that were transferable. Uh, one of them in particular was the box squat. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that I'm just not as sore. Uh, it also replicates a deadlift much better. You know, I, I eliminate the, the stretch reflex at the bottom, uh, which you, you, you're not going to have in a, uh, in a deadlift. You have to create tension from the ground. Yeah. Um, uh, also, uh, with the uh, um, Kabuki transformer bar, as I'm coming up off the box, I lean forward a little more, which really uh, involves a lot of my lower lats and spinal erectors into the movement I, to stabilize that thing, just as though I were deadlifting. Mm -hmm. Because based on my limb lengths, I'm uh, my torso angle is over the bar. You know, I don't I don't sit very vertical, and so you kind of want to try and replicate that as much as possible. The, uh, and I just found that I was able to recover better from that. Mm. Um, the other one is, um, the, uh, camber bar, good morning out of, uh, chains or straps. Yeah. Uh, something that, that Mark and I did when I was down here in 2009. Um, you guys was, were doing that with some crazy load. Yeah. We, we, a lot of concentric stuff. Yeah. It was the point is that <laughs> we, we had, we had so many demands in such a short period of time that we had to try and get the, the greatest benefit, the greatest stimulus with the least fatigue. Uh, do the same thing with the fighters. And some people saw, I posted a video of John Jones doing squats out of, out of straps. Mm -hmm. um, and people <coughs> freaked out that that was, you know, not a great squat or mm -hmm. whatever. But um, it was intentional not to impact his, not to add to his fatigue from training. He's a martial artist and I can't break him down in the gym. So I would, I would pretty much crash down the eccentric drop it into the chains or the straps, the spud straps is what we have at our gym. And then I would lift the concentric portion. And I, and I tried to, the strain component of that, the speed at which the bar moves is what's most important to me because it's mm -hmm. going to, you know, strength is specific and you, uh, the closer I can get to replicating that, the same speed, uh, uh, the same amount of intensity or strain, uh, the more transferable it is. And so I would do that. And I, I would, again, I would experience less, fatigue from doing those movements, waves of three or four weeks, building those each week, tested on the deadlift. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I look at the, at the bench squat and deadlift as a test, uh, but I don't, I don't live there uh, to train to, to improve it because it's just for, at my age, it's just too fatiguing gotcha. overall. How about uh, sodium? I've been very curious about that um, because pre jujitsu, I'll take uh, so like right when I wake up, I take uh, some sodium. So I take some electrolytes, so a thousand milligrams, 
and then I'll take another uh, shaker cup full of another thousand milligrams. And then post workout, I'll have one of these big guys right here, and it'll have two in it. So I'm um, what is that four already? Yeah. Um, I've gotten up to seven, and I felt pretty damn good. And then I've had like six this week and then I would eat dinner and I'd have to run to the bathroom. And I knew right away what was happening, yeah. right? Because these have magnesium in it. Um, I'm curious, uh, what are your thoughts and, and advice for uh, sodium intake for athletes, specifically jujitsu athletes? Yeah, well, I'm glad you, you specified athletes because when I talked about sodium previously, the medical community went ape shit uh, <laughs> as though I was making recommendations for sedentary hypertensive uh, geriatric people. Mm. Um, uh, and they had some issue with uh, the timing. Uh, generally, well, always, athletes will need more sodium than the general population. Uh, it kind of depends on diet as well. I also mentioned that if you're not eating a lot of uh, fast food or packaged food, that uh, that uh, you're, you'll want to supplement the sodium back in. So I always said salt your meals. Is I'm, I'm not salting a McDonald's or a, uh. a you know a, a can of uh, of uh, potato chips, um, but I will salt you know whole foods that you make at home buy from the grocery store. Uh, generally speaking, on average, you lose at least two grams of sodium per hour of training from sweat. Huge variability there is genetically determined. You might use up to Lane Norton burns up five grams of sodium per hour of training, and he trains two hours a day, so he's burned up ten grams of sodium. Wow. Um, wow. We might have talked this about this uh, last year, to be honest with you, because I went through and I, I, I s spoke quite specifically about the fact that Lane Norton had made a very similar video subsequent to mine about how he oftentimes will use up to ten grams of sodium on particular athletes because that matches their demand. We like to weigh our athletes before and after training, and for every, this is consistent with the International Society of Sportsmen uh, Nutrition's recommendations, but we weigh them before and after training, and for every kilo of, uh, uh, about every two pounds of, of weight that they lose during training, uh, we replace that with about a 1.5 liters of water, um, and then sodium and carbs with that. Now, Dr. Sandra Godick, uh, uh, who's a PhD, in uh, thermal regulation and hydration, who runs the Heat Institute and does most of the sweat testing on the uh, NFL and hockey players. I just spoke to her a few weeks ago. Uh, matter of fact, she's been helpful for me over the years getting sweat test patches for a number of the athletes that I've worked with so she can actually determine what their actual sweat rate is. Uh, that can be important at a high level for some people. Uh, she's got a product called Levelin, and uh, it's... Uh, uh, somewhere between 900 and 1500 milligrams of sodium that she'll add per uh, liter of water post-workout mm -hmm. uh, based on what the individual's uh, sweat rate was or how much they sweat out, uh, along with uh, carbohydrates uh, for that. It helps with absorption, it helps replace uh, some of the carbs that you burn. So she puts it all together into one, one drink. Now, that's a good recommendation along with salting your meals, uh, especially immediately post-workout if you're training a second bout that day. That's when it becomes really important to get that, that post-workout window satisfied. I like to put carbs in a post-workout window anyhow because uh, they're absorbed much quicker and, and stored as glycogen uh, and, and replenish your system. You don't necessarily have to, but they, they seem to minimize muscle uh, breakdown. Uh, so it can be helpful with that. Now... Pre-workout, intra-workout. Um, I had always recommended, say, 500 milligrams per liter of water uh, pre-workout. It, it seems that some people may, uh, as you mentioned, running to the bathroom, some people with 500 milligrams per liter pre-workout, uh, maybe too much salt, and they might end up uh, running to the bathroom. Some people who tried to overdose the recommendations, you know, mm -hmm. one is good, 10 is better, <laughs> ended up, you'll end up throwing up or uh, either throwing up or having diarrhea. It's not a more is better scenario. Um, the recommendation is, let's put it in percentages, is somewhere between one and 2% sodium. Uh, so that's going to be about 100 or 200 milligrams of sodium per liter of water and about a 3% glucose solution. So it's about 30 grams of carbs per liter of water. That's the easiest to absorb. It, mm. it, uh, it sets it up so that your, your gut uh, is able to absorb um, the salt and water and carbs together. They, they work collectively as to, to transport the water as a vehicle. Somewhere in that range, so you're looking at half of an LMNT, wait, 
a quarter of an LMNT per liter of water because there's about 1,000 milligrams of sodium mm -hmm. in an LMNT. Or uh, liquid IV uh, is only 500 milligrams, so probably a half liquid IV per liter of water would be an example, and then 30 grams of dextrose. You put too much sugar in, like a lot of the, uh, the Gatorades, et cetera, uh, it can cause, uh, stimulate the kidneys to release water. You end up over peeing. So what happened at my meet, so what happened at Larry Wheel's meet when I worked with him some years later, um, I was downing, uh, was it Pedialyte or Gatorade? Mm. I think Gatorade. <laughs> really high in sugar, not necessarily nearly as high in salt. Mm. Uh, it's made for taste more than anything. And uh, too high in sugar, too low in salt. I started pissing every five minutes mm -hmm. and ended up dehydrating myself and cramping. And that's when... Uh, Mark and Jesse jumped in with uh, Nun tablets and got me rehydrated. So um, there's definitely a benefit. I I get extraordinary feedback that people who start to implement this have much more stamina and endurance. Their performance improves. There may be a lot of people that don't come to training sufficiently hydrated. And this protocol, it may just be the hydration uh, mm -hmm. more than the salt that are drinking sufficient water. But at those doses... It's very well tolerated. Larger athletes can probably tolerate more and may need more. Uh, I'm cons always cautious about the salt concentration. That's what the, the biggest problem with, um, with foods, packaged foods that are high in salt, don't have any moisture or any water with them. So you're getting a lot of salt with no water. Mm. The salt concentration, the amount of salt diluted in, in the amount of water, can uh, a really high salt intake with not enough fluid can have an adverse effect on the endothelial lining. So that's a, a secondary concern. Or even um, potentially increase some cancers of the stomach, which we see in Japanese populations who uh, eat a ton of fish and tend to salt a lot of their food. Uh, they can so uh, Cautious, not a more is better mm -hmm. scenario. Use it as part of an athletic program responsibly. Uh, probably the bulk of it. Uh, throughout training, uh, I might also mention, you want to try and sip. You're probably better off getting eight ounces every 20 minutes rather than gulping a huge amount of it, mm -hmm. uh, especially if your bout exceeds an hour and a half. If it's a really long uh, bout of training, you will, you will and should have some weight loss during training. You're not trying to stave off all the weight loss. You don't want to be over-consuming water mm -hmm. during whatever exercise. Uh, football practice, soccer, et cetera, some of those sessions go well over an hour in pads, lots of sweating. Mm -hmm. You're better off drinking something 15 to 20 minutes in a in a six to eight ounce portion. Okay. Yeah, um, I was actually surprised at the amount that you recommended for intra-workout because, like, I, you know, I'll, I'll have days where I'm feeling a little, you know, tired from the morning workouts and stuff, and then so I'll pound a bunch of electrolytes, and I'm like, oh, I feel better. Same thing. If I feel good off of four, then I'm going to have five and six, and maybe I'll have two before or at, during yeah. my workout or whatever. But I, thankfully, I never did that because I'm like, I just need to slow down. So the thought of taking even less than what I'm already taking, like I'm going to definitely give that a shot because like I said, I, I feel great like afterwards when I, when I do kind of ramp up the electrolytes and the sodium, but then when I do a little, like probably like the one or two too many, that's when it, it cleans me right out. And it, like I said, what was interesting though, is like I, I did seven and I was like, oh my God, like maybe I really do need this much. And then kind of like what you're saying with the noon tablets er earlier, it's like, well, shit, like this is going to cost a lot. But uh, what I'm getting at is I, I did find my threshold. And then even when I tapered back, I still kind of had the same stomach reaction to it. So that's why I was like, I got to ask Stan, what, what the heck we need to do with yeah. sodium because yeah, more isn't better. Yeah. And the nude tablets tasted great, but I started feeling guilty about my hundred dollar a month habit along with everything else that I do. <laughs> I'm kind of a cheapskate at heart. Uh, so I ended up getting on, on Amazon and buying sodium chloride tablets. They don't, there's no taste benefit to them. One of the interesting things that Sandra Godick uh, talks about is that she likes to have, uh, it should taste good and be cold. She creates these slushy machines, uh, especially like for sports, if it's hot out, uh, the, mm -hmm. that can help cool the core. Um, but for kids in particular who don't have a very good, uh, for adults, she says, you know, drink when you're thirsty, but kids don't have a very good uh, sense of mm -hmm. that and they can get dehydrated. Um, so she says it should be cold and taste good. They'll be more likely to drink more of it more often. Okay. And then what if you are peeing a lot? Uh, then I would think it was too much sugar. 
Mm, okay. That would that would cause you to start peeing too much. Okay, because I I'm on my so this is going to be my th- second one of the day, and I feel like I'm still I could handle like another two. Yeah, because like, I'm I'm just like I said this morning was a really really good session, like head to toe dripping in sweat. So that's all I was trying to ramp up a little bit more today. But again, I don't want to have that that GI issue later on in the day. Yeah. Um, but it's, there are some days where I'll have like one and like running to the bathroom to go pee, and nothing's changed. You know, my diet's pretty much the same every single day just maybe i guess i hydrated more the day previously and now my body's like we're good yeah well you get you kind of after a while you get a little better at, uh, mm-hmm. at not having to run and pee all the time your body gets used to okay. to holding on to that water it, there is an adjustment phase that was interesting one of your lifters yesterday came up to me and he was talking about stan i get up like twice a night and pee is that a problem <coughs> mm-hmm. and i'm like well what's going on right now a lot of times you know, bodybuilders, powerlifters, strongmen, football players, et cetera, they have to eat a lot of food and drink a lot of water throughout mm-hmm. the day. And I, I know the conventional advice would be to, you know, cut off your water intake after 4 or 5 p.m. Uh, and as an athlete, you don't necessarily want to do that. You know, you want to stay hydrated and, and keep hydrated and you want to go to bed thirsty. Uh, and so I said, really, the only alternative is the story I told you back when Flex Wheeler was making me drink two gallons of water a day, which I think was too much. And I, I had this little, uh, <laughs> this little, uh, uh, what do you call those little plastic uh, KitchenAid mm. uh, garbage cans next to my bed so I wouldn't have to get up, take my CPAP off, walk to the bathroom, turn on the light. Uh, what? I, I, would just, I would just do the whole rollover. <laughs> Come yeah. on, man. I'm telling you, brother. I'm telling you. The time you get up two times a night, take off your CPAP, walk to the bathroom, turn on the light, and uh, it's so much easier. I'm you just you. had a catheter installed, man. No, I'm not going that far. <laughs> but my 92 year old pops again. I mentioned he lived with me. He lives with me. Of course, he has one of those because he can't get up on his walker in the middle of the night and walk all the way to the bathroom. And so he's got one of those little plastic, you know, hospital bed type of things hanging there. So yeah. he go to the bathroom. And then when my nine-year-old son recently broke his leg, same kind of thing. He couldn't get up and walk to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And I certainly didn't want to get up and carry him there every night. So he ended up with one of those little plastic bottles. And so I, that's what <laughs> I told your lifter last night. I said, brother, you get one of them little plastic bottles, your problem solved. I said, you hardly even have to turn over depending. I mean... <laughs> You could probably just lay right where you're at and dart <laughs> <laughs> and, be, and so, hang it over into the can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <it> just <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Andrew. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, man. Power Project family, if you're trying to increase your muscle mass, if you're trying to lose body fat, if you're trying to stick to a nutrition plan, if you're trying to get fit, pretty much if there's anything you're trying to do for your health, we know that sleep is the biggest determining factor to help you get from point A to point B. That's why we've been sleeping on eight sleep mattresses for probably more than two years now. And the main reason is the technology behind the Pod Pro. Now, the Pod Pro is like the Tesla of beds. It will change its temperature based off of how you're sleeping during the night. And if you have a partner that's sleeping on the other side, they could have their own temperature settings. We all sleep hot here, and I used to wake up in a puddle of my own sweat. Gross. That doesn't happen anymore because of the eight sleep mattress, and I've been getting the best sleep of my life. Now, if you don't want to replace your mattress, you can just get the Pod Pro cover and you can put that over your current mattress to get all the benefits of eight sleep. But if you also need to replace your old nasty mattress, <laughs> you can get the Pod Pro cover and the eight sleep mattress. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes. Yeah, so you guys got to head over to eight sleep.com slash power project and you guys will automatically receive $150 off of your order. Uh, again, eight sleep.com slash power project links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Hey, <laughs> one last question before Andrew takes us out of here. And that is, uh, can you give us your thoughts on what are You've talked many times before about how important it is for most people in America to lose weight and the health benefits associated sometimes with even just losing about 10% of your body weight. Uh What are your thoughts on Ozampic and some of these other types of drugs that are helping to suppress people's appetite? Is there... Is there something that we're not paying attention to? Is there is there something that's going to rear its ugly head um, with these particular pharmaceuticals? I don't see it at all. I think it's one of the most amazing things to uh, tools that has become available, incredibly effective. Uh, it's a significant safety profile. I don't think any more so side effects than would be for that kind of weight loss that, uh, in the absence of. Um, I know that Dr. Peter Tia came out recently and has had made the claim that people were losing muscle at a greater rate. And in fact, that's not the case. Uh, and we have obviously with, uh, you know, us recommending lifting weights and eating sufficient protein, uh, you can 
completely maybe uh, taking a little testosterone maybe a little bit of that too you completely eliminate that problem (laughs) uh yes they're (laughs) incredibly effective i mean i've said many times that that uh, the biggest reason that people uh, can't adhere to a diet is hunger and willpower is not an effective strategy uh, to overcome hunger. Mm-hmm. You're, you're not lazy, you're not undisciplined. Uh, I mean, there's a whole hormonal milieu that, uh, that says, you know, F off, get me some food right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're just miserable. Um, and, we, you know, we utilize a lot of techniques for that. We have a whole toolkit full of uh, satiety things, eat more protein, eat more fiber, you know, drink more water and sleep more and, you know, whatever. They're largely ineffective. I got to be honest with you. I, I always felt like I, I landed in the wrong industry with our 90 plus percent failure rate. You, just, you feel bad all the time when you're trying to help somebody and the, the recidivism is uh, terrible and most diets don't work, not specifically because of the diet, because of lack of adherence. And I always said I wished I'd gotten into the chiropractic business because 95% of pain resolves itself spontaneously within four to six weeks. No matter what the hell you do, you high five the guy to on 10 visits and be like, you're good. Uh, I'd like to be in a business that had that kind of a success rate, irrespective mm-hmm. of the intervention. Um, but uh, those medications are unbelievably effective. Some people uh, you know, as everybody, it's individ- individualistic. They'll respond with uh, more gastric distress than others. Same thing would happen with, say, metformin. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people just get nausea. Um, it does slow down uh, they call gastric motility, the rate at which food passes uh, through your stomach and your intestines. And that can cause a problem for some people in terms of, say, constipation or whatever. But you just got to drink plenty of water. Um, the recommendation there is just to, to titrate appropriately. Don't just jump right in at one milligram a week. Um, you know, I would even, and they have weekly injections because they found that it's more convenient, mm. uh, for the individual. It, the compliance is better. Uh, me, who's, you know, quite accustomed to jabbing myself with uh, every other drug on the planet that makes me potentially bigger or stronger. I don't mind daily injections. You can do that. And, and daily smaller doses of more frequent injections uh, can tend, and again, starting at a, a lower amount and, and uh, titrating it over time, uh, monitoring uh, side effects over time can help minimize the acute effects of, uh, of, uh, of the nausea, et cetera. So that would be my recommendation to try and get on the front end with some of those things. But my only complaint is that those, they're extraordinarily expensive. Not everybody can get them covered by insurance. Um, the long-term weight loss maintenance is north of 16, sometimes 20 plus percent. Uh, long-term weight loss maintenance in the control group is 2%. Hmm. So, I mean, it's just nothing on the planet right now. People were talking about putting statins in the water because they thought that that would decrease cardiovascular disease. That pales in comparison to the benefits of weight loss in terms of overall um, uh, mortality risk. Mm. Uh, you talk about wanting to put something in the water to get people to eat less. I mean, there's a lot of people that, um, who, who would wish that the government would intervene uh, with ultra-processed foods because we see that overeating is the primary driver of, uh, uh, of the obesity epidemic. It's just increased calorie consumption and the availability of, of highly palatable ultra-processed high calorie foods. And we see when you compare, um, you know, two groups of people that eat whole foods as compared to ultra processed foods, the ultra processed foods people eat 500 more calories a day on average. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's really ultimately the, 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 the foundation of it the, is what our obesity epidemic is caused by is over consuming um, those kinds of foods. Now, I did a video on the obesity uh, epidemic some years ago and I, I talked about the fact that I didn't... Uh, it probably would take government intervention to have a significant impact. Unfortunately, they'd screw it up and they'd charge everybody way too much money and they would pilfer, uh, you know, they, they, as is happening now, they'd get donations from all of these uh, large processed food companies to, uh, to usurp any benefits that, that we might realize. So I, I don't think that's an effective solution. We'll have to come up with something, but it's going to take something at a great level. Um, this is probably the second best thing to... Um, to some sort of um, uh, intervention is using some agglutide, Ozempic, uh, um, and the others. Uh, my big concern is that I thought it was too expensive. Uh, Merrick Health has, uh, through their compounding pharmacy, um, pharmacies, one of the largest in the country, um, 
FDA is on site. This is why it really maddens me that uh, you get some uh, MDs that uh, complain about using compound pharmacies. And the reason being is, is because their customers are going to compounding pharmacies to get this medication for less than half the price. Jeez. And so they lose the customer. It's not like they're getting kickbacks from pharmaceutical companies. but And so they'll make these, these absurd claims about... Um, uh, Compound pharmacies being unsafe, uh, and uh, but they are FDA regulated, and there's certain to be you know bad actors out there. But um, they're very safe, very efficient, very effective. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are by no means uh, uh, absent responsibility for uh, the most sued companies on the planet. Um, Sixty thousand people died from Vioxx. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't want to, you know, bank on pharmaceutical companies to be more responsible than, on average, than the, than the, the alternatives at a, at an FDA regulated um, compounding pharmacy. But uh, yeah, you can you can through Merrick Health you can get uh, the same medications are very similar, uh, very effective, mm -hmm. uh, for about half the price. And I think that right now cost is the biggest barrier to entry. And I think more people. Uh, suffering. I mean, 70% of our population is overweight or obese. Mm, yeah. Uh, more people should be losing more weight. And if this is the most effective intervention, we should make it more affordable for them. So quick, just a question along with that. In theory, if somebody were to use Ozempic or semaglutide, um, Peter Tia mentioning how people lose muscle, would it just be since like your appetite is blunted and you have nausea, so you don't end up eating as much when you do eat, you want to prioritize trying to get protein and trying not to eat hyperpalatable food because it seems like if you have your same diet habits but now you're losing a lot of weight and now you're just eating still processed crap they did find that when people go off the medication and if they have their same crappy diet habits they can gain their weight back and mm -hmm. which is one of the concerns that, that some people have is that it becomes you know a lifetime medication uh, because the behavior change you know, doesn't come with it so yeah. there should be some good counseling and, and I, I want to go back and reiterate that that because Dr. Peter said, Peter Tia said that people were losing muscle, um, doesn't mean it's factual. It means uh -huh. when you compare a similar weight loss, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's Ozempic or uh, in the absence of that, uh, you get a similar um, muscle tissue loss. There's, there's, there's no, uh, he doesn't have any evidence to, to point to. This is what he said he saw in his clinic. Uh -huh. uh, we don't have any randomized controlled trials showing that that's factual. Um, I just wanted to make sure and, and mention that, that that shouldn't influence somebody's decision. And if you had any concern about that, eating sufficient protein uh, and lifting some weights completely solves that problem. There we go. Take us out, Andrew. So they're putting, they want to put statins in the water. Like, why can't they, why can't they put like Anavar in the water? No like, kidding. That'd be great. I did have one more question, but really quick, Stan. Uh, where can people find you online and learn more about the uh, vertical diet, ebooks, and the meals themselves? Yeah, StanEfforting.com is the website. Uh, ebooks are on there and um, uh, meal prep's on there. At Stan Efforting is the Instagram and Stan Efforting on uh, YouTube. Have some uh, videos on there, free content. Got it. And then, so my son is two and a half years old. Uh, he loves steak. He loves Monster Mash. That's like his main thing is uh, meat, rice, and fruit. Yeah. I'm, we're doing a really good job with his diet right now. He doesn't That's want great. sweets or anything. Obviously, he doesn't even know they exist. But for him, um, w at what point should I start being concerned with like saturated fats and that sort of thing? I mean, it's always a good idea to, to make sure that the, the dietary pattern uh, is healthy and saturated fats are, are kept, uh, you know, I'd say below 14% before you start to see a significant increase or potential increase. Um, but keep those fruits and vegetables in, throw mm -hmm. in some, I, the only thing I would add to that is if you can get them to eat a little bit of uh, fatty fish, tuna, salmon, uh, for EPA, DHA here and there, where, however you can, you can get that done. And then, um, uh, a little yogurt, however you can mix that such mm -hmm. that it's palatable for him. Yeah, uh, it'd be two great additions to his diet. Yeah, he digs yogurt and protein right now. So yeah, sometimes good. it's smoothies if you want to get vegetables for he, kids. He does smoothies as yep. well. Then yeah, you can sneak them in there. Cool, very good. All right, Mark, we're out of here. So a few years ago, Stan got us focusing on our sleep, and that's a big deal for us, which is why we made this podcast for you. You use a CPAP, still check out this podcast. There's so many different ways to improve your sleep, and if you're not, well, you're just kicking yourself in the foot, doing a lot of stupid stuff. So click this video. Right now, sleep well tonight, right here.